Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's House on this second Sunday of the Easter season. That you think about a, a theme, a connecting thread for our worship this morning. It's, it's very, I would say, very closely connected with Christmas, right? When the angels showed up at, at Bethlehem to the, the shepherds and told them, Ah, oh, our Savior is born. What did they do? They went, and go, well, they went and told that good news to the people around them. Same thing, right? Post-Easter, uh, you think of the hugely important, wonderful message. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And, and we see this uh, from the disciples in our readings, etc., and, and in our enthusiasm to share this resurrection of our Savior as well. Let's say good morning to our media friends, media friends on the radio, media friends on the internet. Um, good morning, media friends. Here we go. Good morning, media friends. And so we get started with our service here. Uh, on the hard copy, I'm looking at the top of page three. And let's get started. We begin our service of worship and praise in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We are truly blessed to have our triune God present with us this morning, and we are blessed to be able to join in worshiping his holy name. Great are the works of the Lord. They are honored by all who in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds. And his righteousness endures He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To him belongs eternal grace. We give thanks to you, O God, for your name is near. We will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation the praise for the deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. Would you grab a hymnal and let's sing our first hymn this morning, hymn 225.
Would you please stand and we'll join together as a family confessing our sins. Also join as a family rejoicing that those sins are forgiven through Jesus. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. For the sake of my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me and forgive my sins. God gives each of us his personal promise. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. We have nothing to fear since Jesus has redeemed us. By the same authority God gives to all Christians to forgive one another, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our sins are forgiven through his sacrifice and death. So now let us live our lives in keeping with that repentance. And we pray. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Open my ears to eagerly listen to all that you tell me. Send your Spirit to strengthen my faith and motivate me to gladly live my life to your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Chronologically, our first scripture lesson this morning doesn't happen just too close to uh, Jesus' actual resurrection. You look at Acts chapter 5, and we see this, this dramatic change in the disciples and Peter, right? When you think of the disciples and Peter, those few days just before Jesus died, we don't get a very good picture of them and their 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 faith, their understanding of who Jesus was, that on one time there'd be Peter and the disciples, of course, we're not going to ditch out on you, Jesus. We'll stay faithful to you. We'll fight for you wherever you go. And then times get tough, and what did they do? They ran away. But you look at Acts chapter 5 here, and that whole Pentecost, right, Jesus appeared for 40 days after the resurrection with his risen body, 10 days after Jesus' ascension, was that festival we call Pentecost. And here 
is in the, this aftermath of, of Pentecost where Peter is teaching the disciples are being bold. We must obey God rather than people, rather than men, sharing this message of the resurrection. And so good example, good reminder for us too, to, to be bold, be bold in our witness as we share Jesus in his resurrection. So Acts chapter 5. The apostles, the former disciples, right? The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. That would be part of the temple complex, um, part of the temple complex in Jerusalem. Then the high priests and all his associates who, who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And that's the end of our first scripture lesson. Our next hymn there, hymn 747, is not in the hymnal. If you want to follow along with some music, it's on, printed on page 10. Uh, there is a Redeemer.
next scripture lesson is from the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, where John gives us just a tiny, tiny, tiny glimpse of the incredible reality, the incredible blessing that is heaven. No more sin, no more sorrow, no more disappointment, no more death. And again, you think about the reason for sharing good news. It's that good news. Someday that's where Christians, we will go for eternity in heaven. A message so important to share with, with everybody. And so this whole picture, when you talk about Alpha and Omega, okay, what's on our, kind of what is on our bulletin cover is this picture, right? Alpha was the first letter in the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. Kind of like us saying, from A to Z, Everything in between includes everything. Our God is everything for us and our salvation. He is the Alpha and the Omega. So this morning, reading from Revelation chapter 1. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's the end of our second scripture lesson. Going through our confession of faith when we go through the second article, good review, right, of all three articles of the Apostles' Creed to say, oh, thankfully God the Father creates me, gives me my life, my time of grace. He sustains my life. Thank you for that gift, Heavenly Father. First article. Second article, God the Son, Jesus. Third article, God the Holy Spirit. He sanctifies me, gives me my faith, and strengthens that faith. But this morning, focusing on Jesus, the second article. Let's join together. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. Would you grab a hymnal again? Hymn 402 is our second hymn this morning.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, I would say that when you bring up the phrase, the term blind faith to somebody, very often there is a negative connotation that goes with that term blind faith. I would say there's the connotation that can imply ignorance, can imply being gullible, being naive, that somebody has blind faith. I think of maybe commercials on TV that say, boy, if you buy this bottle of pills, if you use your blind faith, just trust this commercial. You don't have to do any exercising. You don't have to change your diet, anything. This pill is just magical. It's going to cause you to lose 50 pounds in a week. Have blind faith and buy this pill, this bottle. Or on TV, you buy this fry pan. You take a sledgehammer to this, this fry pan, it's not going to chip, it's not going to crinkle, it's going to have your eggs just slide off the fry pan just like magic. Have blind faith and buy a fry pan. And isn't it true that when we do make some purchases, do some buying like that, it's a good thing to to look into things. I would say, especially if you're buying those bigger ticket items, right, like a washer and dryer, you don't want to have just blind faith and say, oh, okay, I'll trust you. I'll spend a lot of money on a washer and dryer. I'll spend a lot of money on a new car and trusting I have blind faith in all your promises. Let's, let's be a little careful. But in the end, in the end, obviously, truthfully speaking, it, we just don't know how those are going to turn out. And as much as it's true that maybe that term blind faith can imply being gullible to be a little naive, yet isn't it true every day you and I practice blind faith as we live our lives? My car needs a brake job. I'm going to bring it to my mechanic. My mechanic calls me up and says, you're done. Your brake job is done. Come and get your car I have blind faith. I trust my mechanic. I have blind faith that he put it back the way it's supposed to, and then when I press on the brake, it's going to stop. So when I'm driving my car up to Yankton, don't I have blind faith that when I'm on Highway 81, that those cars coming south and I'm going north, I have blind faith. They're going to stay on their side of the highway, and I'm going to stay on mine, and I'm going to stay safe. But then when I'm driving on the way up to Yankton, I brought a little snack along. I brought a Snickers and a can of Pepsi. Aren't I practicing blind faith when I open and start eating that Snickers and drinking that Pepsi that nobody on the production line slipped in some strychnine into that chocolate, right? Nobody slipped some strychnine into that Pepsi. I have blind faith that that's safe for me to eat and to drink. Thankfully, we don't have that ignorant, blind faith when it comes to Easter, when you look at Jesus and his resurrection, when you look at Jesus and his appearing to how many people, and in our text, Jesus appearing to his disciples, we're going to be looking at that wonderful truth, the wonderful assurance that comes with faith, and the encouragement, the promises that God gives to his disciples, to Thomas, the encouragement that he gives to us today, examining comforted by this wonderful promise of the Christian and blind faith. We see, first of all, the cause of blindness, but then also we're going to look at the cure, the cure for blindness when it comes to faith. So would you follow along in our text this morning, reading from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. John writes for us. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, "Eh, 
unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's our text. Right, when you think of Thomas, that name Thomas, and if you were asked to put an adjective in front of that name to describe Thomas, what would that adjective be? You think of Thomas, I haven't met Thomas or seen him or anything like that, but you think of an adjective and say, was, would that adjective be faithful Thomas? Would an adjective be like fast, fast Thomas, he's a fast runner. Reliable Thomas, big Thomas. No, even for people who aren't so familiar with Scripture, you throw out that name Thomas, and the adjective, the tag that automatically goes along with Thomas is the adjective doubting Thomas. And I suppose, humanly speaking, it's, it's fair to say to have that, that adjective that is describing Thomas. We are told that he doubted, he didn't believe that Jesus had risen. And I think sometimes we hear that word doubting and really don't put as much credence, as much seriousness into that word as we should, doubting. It's not like the word rejecting or the adjective rejecting Thomas. That word rejecting just seems to be more powerful than the word doubting Thomas. Doubting just doesn't seem that serious. But you think of the seriousness of it and to say Thomas is doubting, doubting this resurrection of his Savior, our Savior Jesus Christ. And everybody in this room would have to agree, isn't Easter, this resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the absolute most important foundational truth for the forgiveness of of our sins. Jesus tells Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Stop rejecting this truth, stop rejecting this truth of my resurrection and believe. And this is where it hits the very serious tone, this very serious reality with each and every one of us about the doubting aspect of Thomas and also the very real doubting aspect of ourselves. Obviously, we have not had this opportunity to be in that locked room hiding with the disciples and Jesus to appear with us, but we do know for, for very real truth, we do know what God's will is for us and how to live and how not to live our lives. All of those commands, those ten commandments that God gives to us. And I think of the tactic that Satan used when he first was tempting Adam and Eve, right? What was that tactic? The tactic that he used then and he still uses throughout history. The tactic that he uses with each and every one of us every time he tempts us to sin. What does he do? Doesn't he raise doubt? Did God really say you shouldn't eat from that fruit? Does God really say you should keep all those Ten Commandments? You shouldn't live like this? Did God really say you should, I command you to live like this, to raise doubt? And in all reality, each and every time I fall into that temptation, whatever temptation it is that Satan puts before me, I am doubting just like Thomas was doubting. And you see that very brazen, that very bold comment that Thomas makes in, in our text here this morning? That Jesus appeared to those ten disciples. Remember, there only, only would have been ten in that room on that first Easter Sunday evening. Judas committed suicide, and Thomas was not there wherever he was. But that very bold statement he says in verse 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. That is a very powerful 
statement concerning his doubt, the rejection that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, we'd have to say that Thomas was blind, right? This aspect of being blind to the truth of Jesus' resurrection, his power as the Son of God, blind to the promises that Jesus was teaching to those apostles for the last three years, teaching to us, I am the resurrection and the life. And so we learn a lesson from Thomas in this whole aspect of this doubting that, that he has. And this is what Paul is referring to in the last week or so. We've had a reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We often call it the resurrection chapter where St. Paul is telling the Christians in that Greek city of, of Corinth to stand firm in their faith. You can imagine the doubters in the Greek city of Corinth who were tempting those Christians to turn their back on this crazy story of Jesus and his resurrection. It was just illogical, completely crazy that a human being could rise from the dead. And so Paul very honestly talks about this, this humanly speaking crazy promise that Jesus, that God gives to us. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Most to be pitied. Paul is saying, boy, if Jesus did not rise from the grave, we are the biggest fools the world has ever seen. So much of our attention, so much of our lives, so much of us is spent with Jesus, doing Jesus. We are to be pitied most of all people. But this is when we get to see the contrast of being blind, the cause of blindness, the cause of rejecting, doubting Jesus' resurrection. How is it that somebody like the, the disciples, somebody like Thomas, somebody like us. How is it that we can turn that blindness into sight? What would be the cure for that blindness? Because in 1 Corinthians 15, as much as Paul lays the groundwork to say, boy, the logic, the human logic of those Greek philosophers, humanly speaking, is very, very accurate. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, we are to be pitied more than all people. But St. Paul very quickly mentions that honest contrast, the, the opposite truth that Jesus Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, been raised from the dead. We think of what Peter was saying in our, our first lesson in Acts chapter 5, he said the same thing in Acts chapter 2. That on that first Pentecost, when we see those disciples and that complete change, that complete turnaround in their attitude of those disciples, those apostles, now being bold and brazen and sharing this message of Jesus Christ, their risen Savior, we see that at Pentecost in Peter in Acts 2 and in our reading before in Acts 5 says, we are witnesses of these things. We saw this risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's just amazing to me to see this reaction that Jesus has to the doubts, the doubts that the disciples had, right? He never refers to and, and mentions this doubt of the disciples, the ten disciples that were there before, but they obviously had their doubts, right? They were hiding. They were hiding in fear. Thomas had his doubts, I'm not going to believe it until I see him. But how was it that Jesus addressed those disciples in that locked room? If you were the one, if I was the one who had been rejected by those disciples, those disciples just hours before had said, we'll stick with you, Jesus. But when the time, when the time got going got tough, what did they do? Ran the other way? Somebody did that to you, to me, humanly speaking, I don't know if I would have said the first words that Jesus did. 
that he appeared in that locked room to those disciples and the very first words out of his mouth, three times he says that, two times on that first appearance and then again the second appearance a week later to Thomas. He said, peace be with you. To see the patience, the forgiveness of our Savior God, our Savior Jesus, this peace of forgiveness, this is what he was showing to the disciples and instead of looking at Thomas and throwing that, that adjective doubting Thomas in front of there, let's, let's throw that adjective in front of the disciples' names too. Let's throw that adjective in front of our own names as well. So always remember this incredible truth that the same Jesus who came to those doubters on that first Easter and a week later, the same Jesus that comes to us and says, Peace be with you the peace of grace and forgiveness. Which makes me think of the huge, hugely, vitally important process of repentance. To say what a regular process that repentance needs to be in each and every one of our lives, right? To lay our sins at, at the cross of Jesus. To ask God for a forgiveness of our sins. To hear that wonderful message that our Savior God gives to us, peace be with you. I'll forgive your sins. I do forgive your sins. And then to constantly change our lives. Every day, strengthening our faith, increasing our knowledge of what that God, word of God tells us how to live so that we live our lives more and more to his glory. That we think of this peace of forgiveness that we have through our faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you think of a, a blessing a blessing that he gives to us that he never gave to his disciples. Do you notice the words that he spoke to Thomas at the end of this uh, second encounter that he had with his disciples in that locked room? He gives us a promise some 2,000 years later that he really didn't give to, to his disciples there. Jesus says in our text to Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. With my own two physical eyes, I have not seen Jesus. I haven't shook his hand. I haven't had a conversation with Jesus. And I'm guessing you guys haven't either. And Jesus is informing Thomas, informing us, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The blessing of faith, of blind faith, that I suppose you can say in one sense, yeah, it is blind faith. It's not blind faith based on, on being naive or gullible. It's blind in the fact that I haven't seen Jesus himself in his physical body, but haven't we thankfully seen our Savior Jesus through the truths of his word, through the truths of those gospel writers that talk about his life and ministry and the reality of his holy life, his innocent death and his glorious resurrection? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And it makes me think also of that first verse of Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Let's see, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Years back, I had an encounter with an older gentleman. He was not a member of the church I was serving at the time. He was a history buff and, and was very much, and it was just fun to talk to him. I'm a history buff, and we got along just fine. And one of these encounters, this, this older gentleman asked me, and said, how, how can you believe in that Bible? It just seems so illogical that, that there's very little evidence to this and that, and how, how can you believe in, a, in that Bible? all the things that are included in the Bible. And so I brought up to this history guy, this history buff, and said, well, what about the Battle of Marathon in 490 B.C., where the Greeks defeated the Persians? Pretty important battle in, the, in our world's history. Were you there at the Battle of Marathon to witness that? Why do you believe that? How about the Battle of Hastings in 1066 A.D., when very, a very important battle that, that shaped the history of the European continent. Were you there? Do you believe in that? Why do you believe that, that it took place? 
Were you there on April 9th, 1865, when General Lee surrendered to General Grant to end the Civil War? Were you there? Do you believe that? Well, yeah, it's in the history books. It's there, it's there. Well, why, why do you believe it? Because of the witnesses. This truth, these, these facts were handed down from generation to generation. And doesn't this go back to what Peter is saying in Acts 2? what we read in Acts 5. We were witnesses of these things. We were witnesses. We were there. We saw our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, dear friends, as we live our lives in the glorious truths, in the glorious aftermath of this resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, let's remember this same peace, the same comfort that he gave to his disciples. The first words out of his mouth, out of his mouth were, Peace be with you. The peace of Jesus Christ is with us. We haven't seen him. I suppose you could say we have blind faith, but that blind faith is steady sure, steady sure in the promises and the witness and the truth that we have in God's holy word. Blind faith in our Savior Jesus Christ and our own resurrection to eternal life in heaven. Amen. Would you kindly stay? And now may the grace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, guard and keep us in the one true faith until we reach that eternal home in heaven. Amen. And as part of our worship, we're going to be bringing our thank offerings to uh, the Lord's altar, thanking him for the gifts to us. And while we do that, let's sing verses 1 and 5 of All Depends on Our Possessing. For our prayers this morning, going to be keeping some Christian brothers and sisters in our prayers, uh, keeping Delmer Pufal and Bill Miller in our prayers that uh, they're continuing to struggle with weak health. And then also Gary Jackson is in the hospital. Uh, he said that he should be getting out today. He's being treated for some COVID, uh, doing pretty well actually, should be getting out today. And then also keeping the Family and friends of Della O'Gorman in our prayers. Della was taken home to heaven Thursday night, and I will share more information with you about uh, um, upcoming events, Christian funeral for that. But let's bow our heads and let's pray. Almighty God, Father who made and preserves us, Son who redeemed us, and Holy Spirit who brought us to faith, you reign supreme in the world around us as well as in our own hearts. We thank you this morning for giving us another opportunity to worship and praise your holy name. We ask that you constantly remind each of us of all the blessings that you have given us during our earthly lives. We ask that you continue to motivate us, your children of faith here in Norfolk, to continue giving our time, talents, and offerings so that we all may be better and more courageous missionaries of your word. Gracious Lord, we thank you for giving us the blessings of doctors, nurses, medicines, and technology to use when we have weak health. We ask that you continue to watch over Delmer Pufo, Bill Miller, and Gary Jackson in their weak health. Please bless the care they are receiving, and if it is your will, strengthen their health. 
Remind Delmer, Bill, and Gary, and their families of the peace and strength which comes only through Jesus. And use us all to help these Christian families however we can. Lord, you are the only lasting comfort and peace for us sinners as we deal with the consequences of sin in our lives, with death being the most extreme consequence. But for the Christian, you have promised that death is not to be feared, since through Jesus' death our sins have been forgiven, and through physical death you bring us to be with you eternally in heaven. In your perfect loving wisdom, you have brought your servant Della O'Gorman to be with you. Thank you for blessing Della with the most precious gift of faith, and now be with and strengthen the whole O'Gorman family in the days ahead through that same power of faith which turns to and trusts in your gospel promises. Use all of us as Christian brothers and sisters to encourage and help in the days ahead until we all join with Della and all those saints already home. We know that you have promised to provide and take care of all of our needs. We ask that you protect our farmers as they work with heavy machinery this planting season. And we ask for your blessings on their work. Please send beneficial rains and give favorable weather to us all during these spring and summer seasons. We also ask that at this time of year when things are so busy with school and graduations, to keep all of the children of our congregation in your protecting hands. Give wisdom to our high school and college age young adults so that they make wise decisions and bless all their efforts so that their abilities and gifts and lives are used to your glory. Protect us all so that we may continue to grow in your word and to share the message of forgiveness with the people around us. We ask for these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We're straying a little bit from the normal routine in our Sunday worship. Um, You'd have to be living under a rock not to realize and understand. Um, We're going through a a very ambitious process of of looking into how we can improve our school here. And so when we look at the whole date and the whole dates and schedule of what's going to be happening with this campaign, today is officially called, this weekend is officially called Announcement Weekend that it's it's kind of a contradiction, I would say, because you are aware that things are going on. But so far, I would say things have been going on behind the scenes, setting up committees and doing this and doing that. And now, today is the official, this weekend is the official uh, announcement to say, here we go. Off we go in the the serious uh, follow-up to this whole process of, of raising support, raising finances for our school. And so, putting a few thoughts together for, for this whole thing, it made me think, again, I said before, I'm, I'm a history guy, and, and this history of our congregation is, is fascinating to me. And I went back and, and read through um, some of that history that is, Carol Walker wrote it, um, and, and put it in that, that history booklet that was made for the 150th anniversary. And I just want to share some, some words a few sections that Carol wrote in that uh, history of our congregation. Members of our congregation have maintained a school since the fall of 1866. They put much importance on the words of Psalm 78, which says, We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. And other words of scripture that admonish parents, parents to train up their children in accordance to God's word. The settlers arrived on July 12, 1866. There was a log house with a dirt floor and thatched with sod. This became the first place of worship and school for the congregation. Pastor Heckendorf arrived in October of 1866 
and became not only pastor but also teacher. In the fall of 1867, a 24 by 30 foot building was erected and used as a church, the first of any of its kind in Madison County. It was built of pine lumber. The roof had a loose cover of green willow branches and sod. The floor was made of native willow and covered with straw. It was in this building that Pastor Heckendorf taught the first school in Madison County. It was open to the public and the German language was used. Right? How incredibly things have changed. Uh, not having straw on the floor when you look at the blessings of our school. You, you go over to school and see the various cornerstones and the various additions that were made that you look on the south side of, of the school there by the front door and the cornerstone says, what year? 1948. Then you look through the history and said, well, things are changing. We need to improve. We need to make things better for this education, Christian education. And the next edition was added in 1966 and the last edition in, in 2012. And so as much as things change, education, the needs for, for teaching education in, in our world and our, our environment, um, thankfully one thing hasn't changed when you look at Pastor Heckendorf in a first school, uh, 1855. Uh, the truths of God's holy word, to look at the school that we have as an incredible, wonderful tool uh, for parents to use in this education and, and the support for it. And so when you look at this announcement of saying things are going to be getting much more public, um, meetings that are going to be had and, and committees starting to work more and more, um, there's basically three, three things that are being asked of us, all of us as members of, of this congregation. That first of all, let's keep this whole process, this whole campaign effort in our prayers. Uh, you'll see two things, two things in your, your uh, uh, hymn rack in your pews there. There's two uh, sheets in those racks there. One of them is a, a volunteer card that we keep this whole process in our prayers, but then also we need everybody's help, as, as much help as we can get. Uh, would you please fill out one of these volunteer cards and place it in a box? It's, it's the exact, exact same spot for the census cards that we're here trying to update our information. Um, if you can, if you will, uh, help out by volunteering just to give us a database of, of volunteers from, from a source we can and get names for volunteers and, and fill that out. We'll have that available uh, for this, obviously, today and, and next week as well for, for volunteering. But uh, fill that out and put it in the volunteer box. But then our prayers, our volunteer work, our efforts together, uh, but then also uh, where the rubber is really hitting the road, too, is saying uh, we need our, our extra financial help when it comes to this. Uh, to seek the Lord's wisdom and, and see how is it, how is it that I, that we can can give above and beyond what the good Lord has blessed us with that I've been giving to my, my general um, offerings to the church. What can I do more? What can I do more for this whole process? And so there's just the encouragement, the encouragement for us to, to work together. And, and I, I say that in all confidence that in the relatively short time that I've been here to see all the work, all the, the effort, all the wonderful camaraderie that there is to, to work together for the sake of the gospel. But I find it interesting in that, that history that, that Carol wrote, Carol Wachter, she wrote, uh, it was open to the public, right? That first pub, that school that was opened in 1866, already seeing the wonderful opportunities for, for outreach, for us to, to use this to say, oh, community, uh, of which we are a part, uh, we're here. We're here to share the gospel with families and, and to help those families grow and, and to reach out for um, those who do not yet know who Jesus Christ is. And it'll be interesting when we see Wells Connection at the end of the service to see uh, how they're doing that exact same thing in Florida. So something for us to keep in mind as we, we look forward to this, this process of, of this campaign. So um, something to put on your calendar 
in May 8th, two weeks from today, will be the official campaign kickoff. Technically, I'm just announcing it. Here we go. In two weeks is the kickoff, uh, a potluck and, and, and such uh, down in the basement that we're going to, to uh, officially start moving forward. Okay? Um, with that in mind, our theme, pride in our past, faith in our future, remembering all those blessings that God has given and a humble pride in what God has done for us, uh, humble faith in the future, what God will do for us in the future too. All right, with that in mind, would you turn to page 8, page 8 of your service folder. And a section of scripture that pops out in my mind with this whole thing is Mark chapter 10. Um, Jesus raising the importance of, of leading children to, to the, his truths, leading children to the gospel truths of, of his grace and forgiveness. How about we read through that Mark chapter 10 section together, then we'll go through that responsive prayer on page 8. Let's read together the Gospel of St. Mark. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. We pray. We are here in God's house to give him the thanks and praise he deserves for all that he has done for us as individuals and as a congregation. First, we thank God for the gift of forgiveness through faith in Jesus. But we also thank you for the incredible blessings to our congregation through all our buildings and grounds. O almighty and everlasting God, as we begin another ambitious project here at St. Paul's, we are reminded of the many gifts and talents with which you have blessed our congregation. We thank and praise you for the generosity of all the time and talents of so many volunteers who serve in so many different ways. O almighty and everlasting God, you have given us material wealth far more than we require for our basic needs. Lead us to wisely use these gifts as we support the financial needs of our congregation and synod through our cheerful and generous offerings. Yes. To wisely enjoy and share the things you have loaned for us to use in this life. Make us always grateful for your generosity. Lord Jesus, you have commanded us to instruct the young in your saving truth and to share the gospel with as many people as we can. Please continue to bless our school as you have for the past 155 years. Give humble wisdom to those who teach and humble, eager hearts to those who learn. Grant that your word may be passed down from one generation to the next until all your lambs are safely gathered into your eternal flock in heaven. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our good shepherd. Amen. And one thing, the other thing, the card that's in those, those hymnal racks is a campaign prayer card. We're going to be using this campaign prayer a lot in, in the months ahead, uh, in our services, in our meetings, uh, what have you. Pastor Schlewe wrote up this wonderful short little prayer. And again, just a good reminder for us and the, the whole goal, the whole project that we have in mind. And how is it, how is it that something, something is going to happen uh, to bless our school? And so let's join again together in our closing campaign prayer. Now it's also printed in your service folder. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we at St. Paul's give thanks to you for opportunities past and present to worship, study, and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. As we come together to commit ourselves to your direction for our future, we lift our hearts in gratitude, O Lord, for all those who helped prepare the way for us, 
for their worship, devotion, service, and care of this beloved church, school, and property. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us in faith for the future. Trusting in your love, help us to move forward with open and willing hearts so that we continue to grow and serve to the glory of your name. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's close our service this morning. We've got three verses of our last hymn there, in 512. Good morning again. Boy, pardon my stuffed head. Well, still is a good morning. Windy or not, cold or not, good to see you, good to be with you. Again, those volunteer cards, there's pens right there. If you can, fill one out right now and put it in that box or fill it out in the future. That would be tremendously appreciated. Um, there's no Sunday school. The Marcrafts are in Wisconsin right now. There's no Sunday school this morning, but we are going to have Bible class reviewing. We had been going a few weeks ago reviewing baptism. Now we're going to go through uh, Lord's Supper, just reminding ourselves, going through Luther's small catechism, going through uh, the Lord's Supper here this morning. And a part of this uh, campaign announcement, um, John Eaker, Don, would you pass out those, um, those newsletters, that part of this to say, okay, here are names, here are committees, here's the stuff, here's some in information that... that uh, as I said, this campaign is uh, getting more and more public and saying, here's the nuts and bolts of what's going to be happening. Uh, and and please, please put two weeks from today, this May 8th, on your calendars for, for being here in this, this campaign kickoff, uh, May 8th. Um, Della, Della O'Gorman went home to heaven Thursday night. Uh, her Christian uh, funeral service will be Tuesday. Tuesday morning at 10.30. Visitation will be at the Home for Funerals uh, Chapel over there on, on Benjamin, just, uh, just east of here, on tomorrow night, Monday, uh, 5 to 7 uh, visitation, Monday night evening, 5 to 7 service, Tuesday morning at 10.30. And then next weekend, this is just going to be a busy time, uh, end of school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Next weekend is going to be the confirmation weekend. Uh, that the examination, public examination, will be Saturday night. We will not, it's a, it's a communion weekend, but there will not be communion served Saturday night. It's that examination uh, evening is going uh, to be the service. And I, and I would say a good, good opportunity to review, again, going through the, the basic uh, doctrines that are included in the small catechism and, and having the kids have the opportunity to show that we have done some work, they have done some work, they do know uh, the basic doctrines of, of Scripture, understand what the Lord's Supper is, but good opportunity for all of us to, to go through that same 
examination process and say, oh, what have I forgotten since I went through, through confirmation? So that's next Saturday, or this Saturday night, evening, and then uh, confirmation Sunday a week from today. There will be, will be communion on that Sunday, okay? Uh, the Wells Connection, uh, as I said, kind of interesting timing to see uh, this, this story on uh, the preschool and, and the outreach that they do and how the congregation uses that preschool to uh, reach out, uh, reach out with the gospel to, to community families. So let's give attention to our Wells Connection. Blessings on your Sundays and the remainders on, in your weeks ahead. Good morning. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Risen Savior, started as a home mission church in Lakewood Ranch, Florida, recently became a self-supporting congregation. In August of 2020, they opened a preschool. In addition to teaching children about Jesus, the congregation has been active connecting and building bridges to parents. It's Harvest Festival at Risen Savior a fun, festive family event for the children who attend the church's preschool. But there's something else going on here. Members of the congregation, even those without small children, are here too. They're connecting with parents, creating an inviting atmosphere, and building relationships. We've invited our congregational members to come and just to be a part of the school and to get to know the, the children and the families and, and trying to merge those two into, into one family. Building that connection between the classroom and the church has been a special focus for Risen Savior's preschool director, Maria Hines, and the entire congregation. God called me. He just placed in my heart a special place for these young children. Doing the early childhood ministry, it's not just about the children, but we are ministering to our parents that are coming in, and the way to do that, building those relationships with them. The growing Lakewood Ranch area attracts young families with children. Seeing this growth, Risen Savior realized a children's ministry could help them connect more families to the gospel message. And as we got to know our community, we saw there is a big need for Christian education. And, and especially at the preschool level. And God has been richly blessing at the last year and a half um, with a lot of families who are coming and giving us a lot of opportunities to share Christ with them. Case in point is the Davis family who are new to the area without a church home looking for quality education. They enrolled their son, Billy. How great it was for Billy, really, um, yeah. in those first few weeks, even he would come home and talk about God and talk and, about... And sing his cute little know, songs, it was so cute. And those kinds of things, which kind of brought us back to maybe, you know, that we should be a little bit more involved and get him growing up in a uh, church community. The preschool has grown from 20 students to over 70, with a waiting list. Families like the Davises are part of that growth. In addition, Risen Savior is working to daughter a mission church in Parish. Certainly, these blessings are from the Lord and demonstrate how He is working through many church members. The goal is a warm, welcoming environment where someone walks into our congregations or our schools and feels connected right from the get-go, that there are people there that care about them. Our Synod has developed a program to help congregations everywhere build that bridge from children's ministries and schools to church membership. It's called Telling the Next Generation. The purpose of Telling the Next Generation is help a congregation have a plan. When they come, how do we connect with them? How do we build relationships? And then how do we connect them with Jesus? Our quality schools bring people to our doors. But the next step, church membership, doesn't happen automatically. It requires an intentional effort by all of us to reach out to school families as we reflect an atmosphere of Christian love. As you've seen, the blessings at Risen Savior have led to efforts to plant a new home mission church 
20 minutes north in Parrish, Florida, just east of Tampa Bay. We pray the Lord blesses this new mission to connect with many more families, young and old, so more souls can hear about Jesus Christ. Learn more and stay updated on progress at wells.net forward slash home missions.